How's everybody doing today? Uh, it's Ravi, owner of CSF Cooling, and today is a really awesome, cool day. We're here with uh, owner Stefan Papadakis of his Pocket Papadakis race team, and this year uh, is great because we've come on as your official cooling sponsor. And uh, you know, we're we're doing a custom radiator for you. Uh, um, we're doing an intercooler setup. You have some auxiliary radiators, and you have a lot of different components. Um, that I think a lot of our uh, viewers want to kind of see and kind of just tie our partnership together. So thank you for having us to your shop. It's beautiful. I feel like I could eat my dinner off the floor. Um, it's really cool. And uh, I think it's going to be an awesome experience for everyone to kind of just get an idea of what we're doing together. And maybe you can give us a little tour of your shop. So thanks for having us, Stefan. Yeah, no problem. Let's, uh, let's start the tour. Cool. cool. Let's do it. So we moved into the shop uh, about two and a half years ago and we rebuilt pretty much everything inside okay. from the floors to the walls to the lighting and, and electrical. So this is the machine shop and we've got a manual lathe, a manual mill, and also a CNC lathe and a CNC mill. Uh, so we can machine uh, pretty much anything, you know, we need for the race yeah. cars here. Uh, we send all of our engine machining stuff out to Ed Pink Racing Engines. Okay. Uh, but, but any kind of like brackets or, or um, adapters and things like that we can do here. That's cool that you send yourself out to Ed. Uh, you know, he's a big Porsche guy. Yeah. So I've obviously been following what he does. Uh, so it's nice to see that he's doing uh, your engine work for you too, so. Yeah, I mean that place, they build engines that no one's even alive anymore that yeah. <laughs> knows how they work. Knows how a lot work. Of, they do a lot of uh, restoration and, um, but also a lot of really high performance engines as well. I mean, they're just so precise. Very yeah, cool. They're excellent. Very cool. Hiding in here is my old drag car. So this is this was in the Peterson Museum for a while. Oh, very cool. Uh, Sick. Yeah, but now it's back here at this. Sh but now it's back here at our shop, and it's just you know. 90s. Doing what old cars do, I guess. Is, is this uh, a '90s car, <laughs> early 2000s car? Yeah, it was. It was built in '98, '99. Yeah. Yep. Uh, we it's raced got the, it. It's got the '90s look. Totally. Flames, yeah, yeah. you know <laughs> the way it looks. This is sick, though. It's period correct. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And what, uh, what type of drag racing did you do with this? I mean, uh, what class were you expecting on this? Yep, so this is a front wheel drive drag racing okay. car. And this was, in a way, a, one of the first of its kind mm -hmm. where it was a full tube chassis, yep. specific built drag racing, for, again, front wheel drive car. Mm -hmm. Used a four cylinder engine, uh, made about 650 horsepower, and it held the record for many years, uh, running eight second quarter miles, you know, over 200, 70, 280 miles an hour. Wow. Front wheel drive. So wow. this was a lot of fun. Um, this would have been probably one of the more dangerous cars I've driven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Back when we were building these cars, I learned a lot because when we we're building and uh, racing these front wheel drive cars, we were running ETs and mile an hour that no one had run in front wheel drive before. So we were, there was no one that we could ask how to do it. Yeah. So like tires and suspensions and transmissions and, and, and all the, the, the air, even the aerodynamics uh, were stuff that we were having to figure out uh, for front wheel drive specific. Awesome. What, what, what engine was in the car? This used a 1992 Honda Prelude uh, VTEC engine. Okay. But turbocharged. Yep. Uh, this one was running on gasoline. Okay. Yeah. And, and back then, 650 horsepower was a huge amount yeah. in, in 99. Um, Nowadays, <laughs> you know, we're, we're making a thousand in yeah. like a, in a endurance type of application. Uh, but back then this was the cutting edge. This is great to see because, uh, you know, CSF, we do a lot in like sport front wheel drive stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So, and this, I feel like this was kind of like the foundation for how that series has kind of gone, you know? And uh, you start to see these cars now that we do a lot of the intercooling drag race radiator setups on, they're all doing 1200, 1400 horsepower, but still the speeds are almost, you know, as fast as uh, this was now, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the the scene back then was the basis, I think, or the foundation of a lot of the sport compact scene mm -hmm. here in the US. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a lot of fun those days. Very cool, thanks for showing this to us. Yeah. I'll leave it love open. That, so love that wanna... exhaust setup right there, peeking out the bumper. Over here, we've got a couple of areas where we do uh, just the maintenance on the cars. Uh -huh. So we take care of uh, Ryan Turk's car, uh, Jonathan Castro, and then our 2020 GR Supra. Uh, it's not wrapped or anything right now because it's March, and uh, we're in between doing a bunch of updates, and then we're going to wrap the car in its new 2021 livery uh, here in the next few weeks. It's nice to come into a shop like this, and it's refreshing. You have it's well lit, it's clean, looks super organized, and it's about different than all the other 99% of shops that we walk into. So <laughs> <laughs> nice to see, uh, nice to see something on this professional scale. Uh, thanks. 
Uh, so this fabrication area, so we've got sanders, and welders and cutting equipment and uh, notching stuff for uh, roll cages and bending for roll cages. So everything that's cutting and welding, you know, turn round tubing into bent tubing and flat sheet metal into uh, panels and stuff like that. We can do that all here. Um, we even have like a fixture table. So if we're building something that needs to be relatively precise, mm -hmm. uh, then we have a lot of fixtures and such that we can uh, you know, square up things or, or make different alignments and uh, and clamp it down to the table and you can weld it and make super important, you know, more more uh, accurate parts than uh, without having a flat table like this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're jigging stuff up, you need to have something like this so you can have it all precise. So. Yep. Yeah, very cool. Um, over here, we've got a couple more sheet metal machines. That's just a power shear and then a box break for, for uh, working with sheet metal. Um, here we got a spare engine for uh, one of the four cylinders. Uh, this is, I think, the this is the spare engine for the Corolla. Very nice. Yeah, and then I'll bring you guys to the engine building room. We have our new engine that we're putting together for the the Supra, and so this is still in uh, process. But you can see the crankshafts all in here and. Uh, and we've got the new pistons that are still wrapped up and our BC rods and everything. So who's doing the crankshaft for you? Uh, this is a BC okay. crankshaft, DC crankshaft. 100 millimeter stroke. Okay. So it takes it from a three liter to uh, almost a 3.2 liter. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's pretty impressive what everyone in the scene is doing with the B58 engine. Uh, you know, we, we do a lot of work with the guys down like Titan Motorsports. And, uh, you know, to see these cars already doing 700 horsepower, 800 horsepower, guys are talking about how can we get to a thousand, you know, you're there uh, with everything you've done. And it's, uh, you know, it's nice to see what people have done with the super platform. Uh, it's, it's, it's exciting, you know? Yeah. I mean, you'd hope that after a lot of years, they'd update the technology. I mean, at least I did. Mm -hmm. And I think that they have. Yeah. So, um, uh, really happy that we're able to run this engine in that car. Awesome. What's, uh, what's, what's your... I mean, obviously you build race cars at the highest level. What would you say out of all the aspects of building these cars you're most passionate about? Is it the engine building? Is it the fabrication of the car? Is it the, like, is it the whole package and like being the project management of it all? Is it running the race team? I mean, where would you say you're, you know, like if that's a thing like off the top of your head, you know, just to kind of like, that's what I love about doing these cars, so. I like building stuff that no one's ever built before. Okay. So that's why I like always having the newest car, the newest engine, and then we're able to, you know, try to figure out from our past experiences or I'll call friends yeah. that are really experienced and get some ideas and say, okay, well, this is our best first shot at it. And, yeah. you know, we'll build the engine like that and build a suspension with a specific design and then we'll go out and test it. And then uh, we'll make our list of things that we want to improve and come back to the shop and make improvements and then continually seeing that improvement. Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm passionate about. Yeah. And uh, sometimes it's the engine and sometimes it's the suspension and sometimes it's even just it with the driving and, and, yeah. and uh, strategy with, with competition. Um, but if I had to choose one thing that I would just do, it'd probably be engines. Yeah. I don't know, just always working in a, <laughs> a machine shop yeah. and a dyno and all that stuff every day. Uh, might wear on me a little bit. Yeah. So that's why it's nice to get out to the racetrack sometimes yeah. and it's nice to be out in the shop and, and, and uh, you know, work on other parts of the car than just the engine. And I mean, if you haven't seen uh, the Papadakis Racing engine videos, they're absolutely mind blowing. I think you make some of the best, uh, you know, engine assembly videos and kind of just walking the viewers through how you go through your process and why you're doing what you're doing. So definitely check that out. Um, I love watching your engine videos. I mean, that kind of gravitated me to want to do more work with you uh, just because, you know, I think the passion that you show for building race cars, uh, you know, I always try to tell people it's motorsports. There is competition to it, right? And you do want to kind of squeeze out all that improvement. And like you said, that's what you like the most is, you know, that, that you're striving to continue to, uh, you know, improve on the things that you're doing. And this is the second year you're running this car, correct? So what would you say the biggest challenge or what you've kind of identified from last year being the first year with a new platform, new program uh, with the Supra versus what you're trying to do this year? Are there things that you were like, man, that was kind of a hard thing to kind of, deal with the first year and we've really identified and are addressing it for year two? 
Yeah, so uh, the chassis in the car we've got sorted out pretty quickly. So it, it, the car drifts really well. Uh, it's got good speed. And um, so what we're working on is, is, is on the, the chassis side is making it easier to work on. Mm -hmm. So if the car hits the wall or cars hit each other on the track, then we can come back and fix it really quickly. And then having a bunch of spare parts for the car. Yeah. So that's what we're working on with the actual chassis. With the engine, we've just pushed really hard on the first year, trying to make the power that we wanted to make yeah. to see if there was any big failures. And um, we got to the point to where we can make, I mean, we're making 1,000, 1,200. Yeah. Uh, and so we make the power now we want to make. So now we're working on reliability. Uh, and that comes from uh, breaking stuff. Yeah. So you've got to break a couple and find the limit and then make that part stronger or respec. Uh, maybe some of the clearances or some of the parts that we're using within the engine and then we'll just have two or three of those engines just in case something happens and at that point because it really at the end of the day we are trying to win events yeah and we just need a car that will is enough to win the event mm -hmm. and once we get to that point with the horsepower and the handling of the car it's reliability at that point yeah. and we kind of stop developing um, and maybe in the background, we'll, we'll think, you know, yeah. a couple years out where, what we might need. Uh, but for 2021, it's getting the car reliable and having something that Frederick can get out there and, and drive round after round and, and win events. Absolutely. Uh, for this year, uh, it being year two, like you said, you're, you're accumulating more spares, building more spares. Uh, you know, you have, uh, I would arguably say the top professional formula drift team so you obviously have the one engine in the car how many spare engines are you bringing with you to an event now we'll have the engine in the car yeah. we'll have a complete spare uh-huh and then back at the shop here we'll have parts to build a third got it um i typically don't want to build too many because if we find there's a problem with engine number one it's probably an engine number two in, yeah exactly <laughs> so uh we need to have some some way of making adjustments quickly if we find a problem very cool Awesome. Well, thank you for showing us the engine room. This yeah. is this is awesome. Uh, so next we got my office and um, so in the office. I mean, it's obviously just a, you know a desk and a couple of pictures of the race cars. Uh, and uh, I've got my little three D printer. It's printing That's some cool. stuff right now. What are you printing right now? This is like a bracket for okay. uh, uh, a manifold pressure sensor. Okay. Yeah. Very so, cool that you have that, you know, to be able to just take that, test fit it, make sure it works, send it out to your machine shop and, you know, the, the, the production cycle from getting it in your mind to getting on the car has got to be pretty quick these days. Yeah, so the flow goes, we'll, we'll, we'll have a problem that we want to solve, so we want to mount this bracket, the, the sensor somewhere, sketch out the bracket maybe on paper, go into SolidWorks and go into the CAD software, yeah. design it in the software. And then we can 3D print it out of something uh, to test fit it. Um, and then if we want to have it machined out of metal, then uh, we can either machine it here or send it out and have it machined by somebody else. And then we'll have our, our final part. Yeah, no, it's awesome. 3D printing is changing the game. So, well, yeah, let's, uh, I guess, let's check out the car and uh, let's, uh, you know, you can tell us maybe what you're doing with the cooling system. So right now we're in front of the 2021 drift car that's uh, getting assembled. Uh, like you told us earlier, you're probably gonna be testing it in about three weeks from now, right? And uh, what's the first uh, race of the season and when's that? First event is at Road Atlanta yep. in Georgia uh -huh. and that's in May. Okay, yep. so you got pretty much five, six weeks, maybe two months to kind of get this thing ready to go. Yeah, that in three weeks we'll be out of the track and we'll already do our preseason testing. Okay. And we'll do at least two or three days before the beginning of the season. Okay. And then uh, the cars leave about a week before the first event because we're here in California and the events you in, know, Atlanta. in Georgia. Yeah. So. Awesome. So uh, you got the engine, you got the B58, uh, you know, you got this really nice manifold going into uh, a fabricated intercooler that you guys made in house. Yep. Uh, this is using a CSF barn plate high boost intercooler core. Um, it's actually using two cores because the size that you wanted is not something that we keep in stock. So you took one of our 8046 uh, is the part number core, which is a 25 by 12 by four and a half. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you used one and three quarters of another Put, stacked them together to make this pretty impressive size intercooler, uh, you know, and it's keeping your IATs in check for doing what, 1200 horsepower? Exactly. Yeah, we, I mean, after all these years and with all the fabrication equipment we yeah. have here, we just design what we think would be optimum. Uh -huh. And we go out and we see if somebody 
makes that part. Yeah. So for example, we looked at your catalog of what you already have in stock here. And we said, okay, well, we like the, 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 the width and the depth, but we wanted more height. Mm -hmm. So the idea was, well, why don't we just take one and then cut another one and yeah. we'll make exactly what we wanted. And then we made some uh, fabricated custom end tanks for it. And this is the original intercooler that we built when we built the car. Yeah. And it was great all last year and we're leaving it for this year. Awesome, that, uh, it looks really nice. Uh, you know, while we're talking about the engine, uh, let's talk maybe some of the other specifics of the car. So what turbo are you running? This is the Borg Warner EFR 9280. Okay. And these are this, the largest in the EFR series of turbos. Mm -hmm. They're good for about a thousand horsepower, a little over. And uh, we pretty much max it out. Yeah. And we'll tend to run the smallest turbo to make the power that we want. So it'll spool up quicker. And that works well for the driver for uh, drift competitions. And then we also have a direct port nitrous system that adds another 150 horsepower. Wow. Very, very awesome looking engine. So great. So the intercooler is working. And uh, because you have such a big intercooler in the front, you've decided, and the same thing you did last year, was to continue with your rear mounted radiator setup. Yeah, the theory, there's a couple of reasons we do that. Number one, because we want a relatively large intercooler, uh, if we had, it, there isn't really room for a radiator and an intercooler. Mm -hmm. And if you're stacking one in front of the other, uh, it, it doesn't do a great job of cooling whatever's behind it. Yep. And even, so in our application where we're making so much horsepower, you know, 1200 horsepower, but the vehicle speed is not that fast. Yeah. We're only, some of the fastest tracks we're only doing maybe 100, 110. But part of the track, you might be doing 50 or 60. So yeah. there's not a lot of airflow going through the coolers. So we will supplement it with some fans, but we also want to, we separate them. So that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons for putting the radiator in the rear. But we're also wanting a little bit more weight over the rear of the car to change the balance of the car. And by moving the radiator into the rear, we can have a little bit more rear weight bias. Yep. And uh, that, that makes the car handle better for our application. You, you mentioned something that I think is really important that a lot of people who are into drifting don't realize. Uh, you know, from a cooling perspective, uh, I've done a lot, of, a lot of analysis on what types of cooling systems work best for different types of motorsports. Uh, drifting, you don't, like you said, have a lot of velocity of air. Uh, especially if the car is sideways, especially if there's another car, like if you're in a chase, uh, you know, you don't really have a lot of direct airflow. Where is the air coming in from? You know, maybe it's hitting the side of the car if you're totally sideways. So you really don't want to stack a lot of coolers when you're building a drift car, especially if you're doing high horsepower, which means you have a very, or a larger, thicker intercooler. Airflow in cooling is all about velocity. Uh, so it's entry flow, but also exit flow. So, you know, you have the nice hood vents to kind of like create a pressure zone, get the air out, obviously keep the rest of the engine temperatures down. Uh, and that's why you see a lot of people who put the radiator in the back. Like you said, it's for balance, but also to be able to get fresh direct airflow some other way than stacking coolers. Um, so that's, that's a really good way of doing it that we sell a lot of our R1 motorsports radiator to drift guys who want to put it in the back. It's like a universal triple pass radiator for more of your pro two guys who are doing something like that. We even have some pro one guys who've picked it up and they've used it. So, uh, you know, what you're doing obviously from a professional and engineering scale is going with something custom. So what we did, uh, for this season is, uh, we provided Stefan a custom spec core and two end tanks. And what he's going to do is you're going to fabricate it in-house uh, and you're going to do what you said was a triple pass setup, correct? Yeah, why don't I show you what we yeah. started with? Perfect, and let's then, do that. Uh, and then I'll show you what we're moving to. Awesome. So this was our original radiator. It's actually less cooling area than even the factory uh -huh. uh, Supra setup. But this was the size that we had run with the four cylinders and it was, it was quite good. But, but pretty quickly we found it to not be enough cooling uh, for the specific engine and the power that we're running. So uh, yeah, I gave you a call yep. and I said, hey, we want to add an auxiliary radiator, actually yep. run it in line with everything else. So, so this was a second radiator that we added just before the, the drift season. And it's not super elegant, the insulation, because it was, let's try this out, let's see if it works. And so by adding this, additional radiator, I think it's originally made for yeah. Honda Pondas or something? Yeah, so this is a Rywire radiator that we make for him. This is his larger tuck rad. And you know, this is going into more of a street car, uh, but it's got a nice shape in terms of its rectangular features. And then you've obviously done some custom uh, welding with the inlet and outlet where you wanted. It's a double pass, you know, easy to kind of 
uh, run in series with your other radiator and you know for right before the season it's kind of what we had in stock that you were able to uh, you know use your creativity and your fabrication skills to make work yep so now that we've got some time we're redoing the whole cooling system knowing the capacity that we need so in the rear of the car we have a certain amount of area to work with mm -hmm. and we measured and we said okay if we want to maximize the area uh, I made a little sketch and, and sent it over to Ravi and you guys were able to make us a custom a core with the dimensions we wanted so you know we're in the first week of March right now and Stefan and I started talking and kind of finalized the design at the beginning of or I would say middle of December uh, right before you went to Japan so um, you know and this is what we came up with uh, this is a custom core a uh, lot larger than what you were using last year and also we just sent you pretty much blank end tanks so what you're going to be able to do is mock it up, figure out where you want the inlet and outlet, put your own dividers in to make it into your decision now, which is a triple pass. And a lot of people may hear so many different terminologies when it comes to cooling, like, you know, is it a two row core or a three row core? Or, you know, they get the thickness mixed up with how many passes are in there. So uh, for an explanation of what's going on, uh, you know, we can look at the side of the radiator. And what we spec'd out on this core is a two row, 42 millimeter core. Uh, because you're mounting it in the back, we didn't want to give you too thick of a core, so you need good air velocity, right? And you're creating this pressure zone in the back of your rear hatch, and then that's where the air is going in and it's coming out. So I, I found, or I thought, that the 42 millimeter core, which is the same core we use in all our high performance BMW radiators, all our Porsche radiators, and uh, works really well. Uh, the fin height, which is the spacing between the tubes, is a six and a half millimeter fin. Uh, you know, we have an eight millimeter fin, which is uh, larger fin spacing, but it's less performance. So this is about 15% more tubes in the core versus the eight. We also have a five millimeter fin, which gives you another 15% increase, but I thought that would be too much of a fin pack. And because the velocity of air that's happening in drifting in motorsports, I didn't think you would get optimal cooling. So I, I kind of spec'd out the six and a half. I think it's gonna work really well. Um, it's got our B-tube technology, which is, uh, you know, you see it's on our website. Um, this is kind of what we're known for. It's exclusive to us in the high performance industry. What it is, it's a lighter, thinner, tube than a normal extruded oval welded tube. Uh, there's a brace in the middle that kind of gives it a B shape. And what that does is it makes it stronger, harder to pinch down. Um, so you get optimal flow through the cooler. And that seam down the middle actually has about 15% more surface area contact with the coolant. Um, so it's called dual liquid laminar flow. That's kind of the theory behind it. So you get better cooling, it's lighter weight, it's stronger, it's more durable. And that's why we've been pretty successful with the B-tube technology. So that's what we got into your radiator. Uh, now for the triple pass, what people might not realize or understand when they see a radiator is when they see where the inlet and outlet are. There's three different ways uh, that people have it. Either the water comes in one side and it goes out the other side across the court. That would be a single pass. You have a lot of radiators where you have the inlet and outlet both on the same side. So the water will go in, there'll be a divider in the middle, it'll go through the first half of the core and do like a U-turn and come out the other. Now for a triple pass, what you're gonna do is you're gonna put two dividers. So it's gonna go in here, come around, and then exit the other side. So that's gonna give you three times as amount of cooling. Uh, the, the idea is to lower that temperature delta with three times the cooling and you know keep your engine cool. Yeah. Yeah, we found that the double pass and the triple passes work better in op op our application. Um, the water spending maybe a little bit more time in the cooler mm -hmm. uh, tends to help. Uh, and we have a bit of a different theory with how we cool the intercooler in the front versus the radiator in the back. The intercooler in the front is not getting a lot of air flow, mm -hmm. car sideways or whatever. So we use it, we want a heavy, thick intercooler that acts as like a, in a way a, a big heat sink. I know mm -hmm. a lot of the drag guys do that. They'll have an intercooler under the hood, but then there's no airflow to it Yeah. Uh, because they care more about the aerodynamics. And what happens in the drifting competition is because we have uh, maybe a 30 second run and the car comes back to the line and has a moment to cool down is you'll see some of the air temps come up, the intercooler temp will come up, the car will finish a run, there's a fan on it which will bring it back down and then it kind of cycles through that, that temperature. 
uh, the radiators, uh, it's harder to do that because you'd have to have so much mass with the radiator. Mm -hmm. It'd be hard to bring all that water temp back down. Yeah. So you really have to have a continuous uh, cooling with the, with the cooling system. And we found the only way to do that is with a large amount of surface area on the radiator and some really strong fans pulling as much air through it as we can. Yeah, and that's something that I have a lot of conversations with, with consumers or when we're developing products for either our private label program or other shops who are calling us for a cooling consultation is they're thinking they want a really thick core where surface area is actually more beneficial to proper cooling. So you want more surface area, more travel time in the tube, so more air can kind of cool it down as it's traveling across the core, which is now, you know, the next thing is when you do a double pass or a triple pass, you're getting three times as much, you know, cooling before it leaves the system. Uh, another aspect that a lot of people don't realize is when you're adding these passes, you need to make sure that your water pump matches that. So which pump are you using this year for your car? We're using, <laughs> <laughs> that's God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're using an electric Stewart water pump. Okay. And we found that it flows more than the factory Supra mechanical pump. Yep. Uh, but in past with our other Toyota, the four cylinders, we were fine with the mechanical pump, it had great flow. Uh, but for this one, we're using a, uh, an electric pump. Okay, very cool. Yeah. The other thing, I wanna run this by you, and this is what we found is when we run two thick of a radiator core. Uh -huh. The theory is when you're just cooling with the fans and you don't have a lot of air speed, that the air coming through cooling the core, by the time it gets halfway through the core, it's up to the radiator temperature and it's not cooling the back half of the core. What's your experience with that? I, I, I tell a lot of people that your fan choice could make or break what happens with the radiator. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize this. A radiator is a passive component. There are no moving parts. Everything around it is a moving part. The water pump is a moving part. The fan is a moving part. And a lot of the things that happen to the radiator is how you use it in what application and what system. I always tell people ducting is super important because like you said, if you have too thick of a radiator, you don't have proper du ducting or you don't have enough of a pulse, pulse um, action with the fan, you're literally getting stagnant air and you're not getting this cooling, uh, you know, this cooling effect is what you desire. So we like to always think, and why we came out with the B-Tube is we want to maximize surface area, reduce thickness, increase the efficiency of the components that are in the radiator, and then match it with a high power pump, a good fan, and good ducting, good entry flow, good exit flow. You know, those are how you make a harmonious cooling system. Um, I always cringe when I see people stacking, like you said from the beginning, is like three or four coolers in front of each other. And they always put the coolers in the front that they think are, you know, just based on size. But those are actually the ones that get the hottest. People tend to put an oil cooler, then they put an intercooler, and then they put the radiator in the back. And then they wonder why the radiator temps are so high when they thought they were getting this great radiator. Well, I tell them, you have three coolers stacked in front of each other. The oil temperature is the hottest, so by the time it gets through the oil, you know, now it's going through the intercooler, which is usually the thickest, and now you've reduced the velocity of the air, plus it's hot, and now it's going through a radiator, and usually at that point, you've stacked so many coolers that you've put your radiator pretty close to the engine block. There's nowhere for the air to pull out and draw, and they don't have hood vents, and now they've just created this like just wind tunnel effect where there's no good airflow, and you're not cooling anything really well. So. I always tell people, and what we've done with our Mitsubishi race car, our Evo X, or other cars that we've built, is you wanna space the coolers around the car. You want all of the coolers, if possible, to have their own direct flow of air and their own way of separation, because then you can maximize surface area for everything. Now, obviously, cooling, there's a lot of give and take. Uh, there's a lot of pros and cons to anything that you do, right? There's always gonna be a consequence to every action. What happens then, if you're in a situation, say you're doing a time attack car, uh, you want to have less drag. So sometimes you need to close a lot of these openings and gaps. You can't put a lot of coolers there because you're then gonna be creating more drag, make your car slower. Drifting, not necessarily the case. You just need to be able to get airflow to wherever you can as the car is turning sideways, different speeds. How do you cool everything around the car? I like the idea of spreading the coolers out. And that lo looks like what you're doing this year. Yeah, and you're starting to see that more in the factory cars as well, yeah. where they'll have the inter uh, intercooler or even though just a radiator in the front and maybe water to uh, um, 
water air heat, heat exchanger, exchanger yep. and then some auxiliary coolers on the side or something. I know yeah. the Porsches, I know the GR Supra's like that. Yeah, so the new Supra, uh, you know, which we have a four piece kit for right now, uh, we have a front mount heat exchanger, there's two auxiliary radiators, and there's also a transmission cooler. So, you know, they're all kind of spaced out, getting good airflow into each of these uh, different coolers. One thing I think is a limitation of the Supra body design, the front fascia is actually quite small. So you're not getting a lot of airflow into the engine um, or into that front uh, cooling pack. But, you know, because you've spaced out these auxiliary radiators on the side, you are able to manage the temperatures uh, pretty well. Yeah. yeah. So, Stefan, thank you so much for having us. Uh, I think this is a great start to our partnership for the 21, 2021 season. Uh, thank you for including CSF. It's, uh, it's an honor to be working with you. I've been a big fan for a long time, and we're really excited to see how you do this year, you know, hoping that you can get a championship under your belt this year. So good luck. And uh, stay tuned, guys. We're going to be uh, coming back. You're going to see the full radiator assembled in the car. Um, and Stefan will be able to give you a little bit more of an idea of what it looks like once it's mounted with the airflow going into it, exit flow, you know, going out of the trunk and the, uh, the, the fan choice that he decides to use as well. So uh, thank you for watching and uh, we'll see you soon. Let's get down, let's get down to business. Give you one more night, one more night to get this. We've had a million, million nights just like this. So let's get down. So the intercooler on our GR Supra is a custom setup that we made with a couple of CSF cores. We wanted a really tall one, uh, but within the series that CSF has, we found that there's a really good core that we use, and then we cut part of a second one and we weld them together, and we do our custom end tanks. And this is just a standard air-to-air -air intercooler, and that allows us to cool you know, the 1200 horsepower of, of Turbo Boost on this. The intercooler is the only cooling system we have on the front of the car, and we actually divide it up and we put the radiator uh, that cools the engine in the back of the car. And we get a couple of benefits from that. One is that we get a little bit more weight over the rear tires for a little bit more rear grip. Uh, it also takes the radiator out of the area that could potentially be hit from, you know, other competitors or, you know, stuff that could happen on track. It's a custom core from CSF. And here at the shop, we fabricated a shroud. So the air comes in from the rear deck lid of the Supra through the core, through the fans, and then out through the bottom and back of the car. And that way you don't have a situation where the intercooler is sitting in front of the radiator and the air to the radiator has to go through the intercooler first. What can happen in that situation is the air is already getting heated up by the intercooler. So the radiator doesn't get full uh, ambient temperature air. Back here, the radiator can get its own air supply, just that's the normal you know, ambient temperature, whatever the normal air is, and that'll help keep the car a bit cooler. And right now the car is in its state of uh, getting prepped for this year's season, so we don't have the, all the stickers on it yet, and we're also in the process of building the cooling system for it. So we'll even notice like parts of the, the fan shroud and parts of the, the radiator shroud are not fully welded yet, We'll first make the shroud out of a paper template, and then we'll transfer that to aluminum where we'll cut the aluminum, shape it, bead roll it, things like that. And then we'll tack weld it, put it onto the car, make sure that we're happy with the whole fitment and everything. And then we'll pull it back off, final weld it, powder coat it, and then do the final installation. Right now you're catching the car in the middle, middle, uh, middle of the fabrication. Thanks for visiting. And if you come back again, we'll be able to show you the car all finished and ready to get onto the track.